It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor John Drury, who's a professor of social uh, psychology at Sussex University, uh, and uh, who's written extensively on, on the topic that he's going to present to us now. Thanks, John. Yeah, as David says, I'm a social psychologist. I research collective behaviour and in particular how people behave in emergencies and disasters. And I want to talk to you about how people have been behaving, how, you know, the action people have taken in the pandemic. And um, in the early days of the pandemic, remember back to a year ago, there were two images that the media presented to us of public behaviour one of which was of so-called panic buying. They said that the public were selfish, that in uh, an emergency, these kinds of selfish, uh, irrational behaviours might predominate. But the other image got slightly less publicity. Um, the other image was of mutual aid groups. And in fact, thousands of these sprang up uh, during lockdown in the UK and many other countries around the world, thousands of them, many people involved for the first time in their lives in supporting their communities, as well as people who had previously acted as volunteers, people who previously had been activists. And they were necessary, these mutual aid groups, um, because if you think of the needs um, of public response in the pandemic. Of course, we all need to keep distance. We all need to wash our hands, to wear masks and all these things. But there's something more, something proactive is also needed from the public, from the community uh, in, in, in the pandemic. And that is to support, to actively support people who need to self-isolate. So people staying at home because they were infected or because they were in contact with somebody who was infected, they, they needed their shopping done. This is basic stuff. They needed their shopping done. They needed their dogs walking. They needed their prescriptions collected. They needed their post. They needed emotional support. The government wasn't doing this. This, as in many emergencies, was a service provided almost spontaneously by the public. Um, and in fact, um, having looked at many disasters and looked at the history of research and disasters, what you find is that this response is common. That people, including the people most affected by a disaster or an emergency, very frequently um, organize themselves and are the ones providing help. I read a um, one study which claimed that most of the lives saved in emergencies are by other members of the public rather than by the professionals. And I don't know if that's true, but it does illustrate something which is recognised in concepts like community resilience, that you need the public not to respond in a kind of passive way, but to be proactive in events. So this has been well documented. And if you're interested, I mean, I've got a picture here in my slide of a, a really wonderful book by Rebecca Solnit. Now, she is a, a journalist and this book is a kind of history of different kinds of different emergencies over the past hundred years, going back to the San Francisco earthquake more than 100 years ago, up to 9-11, up to Hurricane Katrina, and shows you some absolutely stunning examples of community responses in emergencies, and then sort of new worlds that were created um, in the months after catastrophe. Now, two types of explanation have been provided for why people tend to give so much support um, in emergencies. And the first is, is the social capital explanation, which if you've got a social science background, you might recognise it means that people already have connections. So in your community, you've got bonds of trust, you've got good relationships in your community, and you draw upon those in the disaster to form these, uh, to form these groups and to support each other. The other explanation is what could be called emergent groups. So that's groups that haven't got connections before that arise within the event to provide this support, um, which is the complete opposite of the dominant explanation of, of panic, public panic, that you know, we, lose our, we lose our social bonds, we, uh, we become individualized and selfish and so on. 
And my interest, the reason I've bolded emergent groups is that's my particular interest. When I first started looking at this, I looked at the London bombings of 2005, where there were four terrorist attacks in London. And why this idea arose in that context was because the people affected, who came together, who supported each other, who behaved heroically in many cases, you know, tying tourniquets, all sorts of things. They were strangers to each other. They were commuters on their way to work, most of them, so they didn't have connections, but they became a group. It became a psychological group through sharing a social identity. And that is a key concept that we found very useful in understanding this kind of phenomenon, that we see ourselves as a group that, you know, who I am is a function of my group membership. And that, that determines my values and my interests and my actions. Um, now, looking at what we know about the mutual aid groups that have arisen in the pandemic, I've got a rather long quote there. I apologize for all the text. But it illustrates that you know, what we know is that the groups that have spontaneously arisen in the pandemic are a mixture of pre-existing connections and new relationships. So, of course, they're based on neighbourhoods um, and your connections with people. You already have connections, but people also want to reconstruct that neighbourhood. They want to reclaim that neighbourhood. And sometimes it goes beyond public health to something else, to to you know, the future beyond beyond the pandemic, you know how they how they relate to their their local community. They want to keep these things going. Now, the other thing we know about these so-called disaster communities, these groups that arise in the disaster and that provide this social support that people need, is that they tend to decline over time. There's some fantastic work by a psychologist in America, Chris Caniasti, um, that shows this across a range of disasters. <coughs> I've got pictures. On the slide there are floods because some of our recent work has been on communities arising in floods and why that matters is because you know six months down from the the flooding event which ruined your home you know that amazing group that arose at the time of impact that gave you that emotional support that helped you bail out your house that group has tended to dissipate and and, and fall away just at the time when you need it when you when you're trying to rebuild your home and it declines for a variety of reasons. People run out of energy, they run out of resources, they get disempowered, the state steps in, all sorts of things. And we've seen this pattern in, in, the, uh, in the activity, at least, of the mutual aid groups. This visualisation is of the, the Facebook activity of 110 mutual aid groups um, from uh, March to October. And it tended to spike up again when the second... Uh, wave, the uh, second lockdown uh, took place in the UK. But it shows you, I mean, these groups are still alive, in fact, but they do have, they, they had fewer requests, but they also had fewer people involved because after the uh, furlough scheme, which was the scheme in the UK to pay people not to work, but to stay at home, um, but keep their jobs, after that finished, then people were less available as volunteers. And it's really crucial because we, we really need this right now. We've got an incredibly high infection rate. Many people need to stay at home and not getting sufficient support at the moment from the government. So I just want to finish by just telling you what we're doing at the moment in this programme of work, um, which is to understand how these groups can sustain themselves over time, given that they're important, given that we need them, given that they do tend to decline, We've interviewed organisers of mutual aid groups and we've asked them what has worked, what has enabled you to keep your groups going, to keep people involved, to keep people motivated and so on. And on the slide there, you can see a variety of factors that, and Maria, who, who's pictured is the main postdoc on this work, um, a variety of factors that people have said have helped one is group care, that there's emotional support which is visible within the group. So people, if they get stressed, there's something to help them. Um, horizontal organisation means that people are able to participate and it's not a very top down structure that they have input into what happens. Regular communication. So we can't have face to face meetings. We can't have in-person meetings. But if people talk a lot about what's happening, that helps keep people in the group and support from others outside the group. Um, local authorities can support through facilities and through information. 
other groups can give support. And then some of them said, well, it's almost a full time job being an organiser and they should actually be paid and that would help sustain the group. Um, and there's a quote there about um, about uh, about skills and the different um, uh, roles that people have within groups, because one final thing I want to mention that came out of these groups is that people didn't only input into the groups in terms of their motivations, and their identities and so on. There was also output in terms of people sometimes getting empowered, sometimes getting politicised, sometimes getting a, a greater sense of community identity from being a part of these groups. And we've documented some of that on our, on our website and our website um, can be seen. This is what our website looks like. And the URL for our website is at the top of my slide there if you want to go and visit it. And I'll put it in the chat shortly.